Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 206, 206. Everything over 200 still sounds weird to me. Uh, February 18th, we're rolling our way through. Hey, it's my birthday soon. That's pretty cool. Um, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now, watching it later. Um, it might be my birthday when you're watching this. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to do triage. We actually have a fair number of things to triage. Um, and then we have some design discussions to pick up since we did that burn pull request last week and didn't make any progress on them. Interestingly, some of our design discussions are showing up in triage, so we may check a couple of them off simply by walking our way through triage. Um, and that's the thing. And as always, if you're here, uh, feel free to say hi. We always love to, for people to say hi. I know Jacob's already joined us. Um, he might say hi. And we will uh, go ahead and I think uh, we just got to jump into triage. And hopefully this isn't another two-hour meeting. We might just have to make it not a two-hour meeting. Uh, Bob, you ready? On that pleasant note, yes. Yeah, well, let's see what we see. All right, this first one is solved in Wix 4, and I believe it's marked triage to see if we would take the PR into 3. Yep. Um, there's no plans to roll another 3 build. I don't know how to feel about taking up PR into 314 for people that want it, but also he's done the work, and I assume it's good. Sean, you've looked at this one. Yeah, um, that's good. So Is it the same as the V4 change? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we could take it in there, but there's no plan to do a 3 build. So it'd be like, yeah, here it is. Easier for someone that wants to do a 3 build, we'll get this fix in it. Um, and just call that. I mean, I'm okay with that at this point. I think that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, you know, if someone's done all the work and we've said it's good and we've got it in four and they want to do the work to put it in three, it's like, okay, we can put it in three. Um, but we're not rolling a build for it anytime soon until a security ro issue rolls up, hopefully never, or, um, and even then we probably would go back to a 311 branch. Um, or when Wix 4 is done and we're ready to have all the things rolled out in Wix 314 to help people migrate to Wix 4 which is the purpose of Wix 314. That said, we might have interim builds for Wix 4 preview releases, no? That, that's true. That's absolutely true. So, you know, this fix could get picked up in one of those things. So, I'm not against it. I think that's kind of where I've ended up with 314. Is the, if someone's done all the work, I'm not against it, um, as long as it's not, like, crazy. This definitely is not that. So do you guys agree, disagree? Does that sound reasonable? Um, yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Okay. Let's go ahead and roll with that. Um, registry values have the same registry cause. Uh, uh, registry values have the same registry cause like, oh, causes like, got it, got it, got it. Okay. If you have the same uh, multi-string stuff, if you do this, you can get yourself where you get the uh, really bad error message that at least we should improve the error message. Um, and then... Bob, it's you better wanted, in V4. It's better in V4. You wanted to bring yep. this up in something to change. Um, yeah. So if you look at the the authoring that caused the error, um, it's just bad. It's bad. It's it, it's incorrect authoring to create a multi SC string. Um, and I think part of the problem is that the language doesn't you know make it tremendously clear how you do. Um, multi SC oh, string. Oh, that is weird. Oh, I see what they did. And you look at it and you go, well, that's not right. And But you look a little deeper and you go, oh, but I can see how you got there. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, yeah. I can't quite go to the extent that it's user error or solely user error. Um, so I was, I was thinking about you know, ways we could make the language such that you can't fall into this trap. Oh, this is really um, bad, though. Like, why do we do that? That's terrible. Like, why have the type when you already had the type's already there? Okay, yeah. Right. So, so, uh, you know, on not a lot of of thinking about it, um, I, you know, made a proposal. One way to do it is to just kind of disallow the use of value if you're creating a multi SC string. Just it's confusing and um, 
I don't eliminate think multi string value. And then it, sorry, uh, I didn't make that clear. That's just because we have currently we have multi string and multi string value. Oh, that is weird. And the attribute is value because we eliminated the inner text. So I decided multi string value value equals is kind of silly. So I just get rid of that one, use multi string. Um and then move instead of action, which today you use for um, to specify you know where the new string shows up, mm -hmm. change put put that logic into the registry value type, and then require the multi-string uh, element to specify values. This way, there's no way you can you you can end up with this authoring. If you know you need a multi SC string, you have to use multi string. Type equals multi string? Or? Well, so. You would remove type, registry value type equals multi string. That would go away. Which I'm trying to figure out which one is it. So <laughs> I have options because I did not look at this hard enough to you know form a strong opinion. Um, so I propose adding, let me form a strong opinion right now. Okay, formed. Um, what I want to do is remove multi-string as a registry type and add multi-string prepend, multi-string append, and multi-string overwrite okay. as type. registry value types. Okay. So action goes away it gets moved essentially into type and based on the fact that we now know based on the type, um, we can disallow value. So the one thing that multi-string value or value was giving before was that it would allow you to define a multi-string, define all the values in it without having to have the append prepend overwrite behavior and do that concatenation around the square bracket tilde null behavior, which I, we didn't, probably didn't want to exposed to people. I'd argue we don't want to expose to people. So it's harder than to define a single multi-string value that doesn't end up doing what this person did here, which was, here, let me call append three times, as opposed to create a single multi-string value with all the values in it. Um, Sorry, are you saying registry value? Oh, God. Registry values value attribute let you do that by doing the bracket till the bracket? Well, it, it, yeah, I think what it did was it, 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 somewhere in there was trying to hide the concatenation of all those. So if you said, here's my multi string value, and you had, you know, 10 values, and you didn't want to have to write 10 values and have them append, right? That's inefficient in the creation of the registry value. And instead of just saying, look, I'm going to write this key and I want to have multi string. The idea was to have an element, in this case, that you would list your multi-string values right. on them, and it would turn it into one single registry key entry, or one registry table entry. By The compiler would do the work to squish those together and stick them to, with the magic. Um, I'm not seeing the change in my proposal. Multi-string element would still exist. It would be the only way to specify a value. Ah. I think we should do something here. How about we go back and write it down as what we think should be done explicitly, and, but I think we'll take it, right? I, we should do something about this, because this is bad, um, and improve this language. OK. Um, and I'm not, I don't, we don't need to do the design right here, because I don't think we disagree that much. Someone just needs to write it down as a, here's what we should do, exactly, as a, instead of the rough proposal. Like, exactly this is how you do the multi-stream. Be like, yeah, OK, that's it. We'll go from there. Can the window installer have a property which contains a multi-string value as defined by, say, maybe, yeah, probably. You probably can do that. You have a property that gets resolved and then contains the multi-string value. Um, are you relying prepend and append? Are you going to offer the option to change if it doesn't exist? I don't know. It's Windows installer behavior. So I don't yeah, think Yeah, this Windows is all by MSI. You yeah. can change. You can overwrite. That's yeah. the, 
that's a, actually that's the default behavior if you um, use the type equals multi-string, which makes sense, right? Here's my without, multi sorry, without value. an action. Yeah, here's without my multi-string, and there's the value. Right? Boom! It just writes it. So yes, I think that's the right thing. And then there's a pen and prepend. So, all right, I think we just need to write this up, kind of look at it and go, okay, here's how it needs to be formatted. But the goal is to be able to define a full multi-SD reg key so that it can be written into the registry table without having to do a pen to make it work, because that's not going to be efficient. But we should also clean it up so it's not confusing. Okay, I'm going to have to re-listen to this meeting afterwards because I'm not clear on on the appends thing. We see here what they're doing is they're trying a multi-string. They write this one and then they append and then they append. Right. So this would end up creating three registry rows. This would not be legal in right. my proposal. Okay. Got it. So I just want to make sure that we don't get into this behavior where this is what people do regularly. Right, where they create one and then append and append to it, especially since you don't get the order defenses. Instead, well, I mean, we can't we can't prevent it. No, no, no. Um, right. You're but, absolutely right. We can't prevent it, but the hope is that if you just write a bunch of multi-string values under, if you enter a bunch of values underneath the registry key that is multi-string, it turns into the correct syntax in the Windows installer. So a single yeah, registry yeah, yeah. is great. All right, great. We're on the same yeah. page on that front. That's okay. the goal. All right. That's the goal. I, I I'm guessing you want a whip. Um, if you think it's big enough, then yes. But I don't, but it's a language change, so it yeah. probably should get one. It'll probably be helpful in the future when someone asks about it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be a long one. So, oh, it won't be. No. no, no. The lower proposed fix, how do you control order? You don't control order today. Like, there's no order in the registry table. That's part of the problem. That's yeah, why you don't that's why you the, want the, yeah. the compiler to do the work. Because yeah. then it can go in document order. Yeah, exactly. For that particular value. Yeah. Exactly. And you get out of the whole, well, you get out of order, which append and prepend always opens you to. Right, right. Do you need to see? Pretty much no. Definition. Jacob, no, you don't, we don't get, no. It's we not that one. big a deal, and, and the one installer doesn't allow us to have a sequence. And I don't want us going around and trying to gather a whole bunch of registry key things into one registry row and figure out which component it goes onto. It's, none of this is you know, we, this we is don't, big enough. We don't want to write a registry writing custom action. Yeah, definitely not that. We'd have to punish ourselves. <sighs> well, yeah. um, I have not done the rollback boundary thing, but I have a good reason. I was working on other bigger things that were blocking Sean. Um, so I, this is still in my list of things to do because it's marked as 40 previous zero. So I've not lost it. I just hit some I felt bigger items to tackle. I will be back for this one. Um, Sean, you know about this one. When files, when getting a files and use message on the .NET chainer, we're returning the wrong value. And then, is this true that we've always been returning the wrong value because it was documented wrong? Or? I mean, from the links that Nir gave, it's been wrong this whole time. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, that's so terrible. basically, like the the UI will say, here's all the processes. Do you want to close them? Mm -hmm. And then basically, what Burn always returns is no, don't close them. <laughs> wow. Um, so it's a straightforward fix in four. Uh, I guess it depends on whether you want to. I didn't look whether there was one BA message for files in use that's shared between MSI and oh, anything I else. So I, don't, I'm, I don't remember I'm the not, net, I don't know where the NetFX protocol handling is and how it's done. I just don't remember. So it, it sounded to me like there should probably be two different separate messages for the files in use. Yeah. All right. Um, it, this isn't preview zero though, right? It's a 4.0 thing. Yeah, I don't know why it would need to be preview zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's files in use with the .NET framework and doing the right thing. 
at least we were always returning no, I guess. If we're going to get it wrong, that's probably the one to get it wrong on. Because, I mean, we're taking more restarts, but we're not having people's apps get shut down on them. Although we would, might have noticed if we got the always yes um, thing. So, uh, All right. Um, BA requests get dropped when UI is shown on the engine thread. Um, this is fascinating that you found. That because we elevate, we can end up with a UI pump on our our thread, what is normally a thread um, message loop, and that will turn it into a window message loop, which then means all of our thread messages are being tossed, right? Yeah. <sighs> Never even thought about this as a problem. That's fascinating. Uh, opinions? Sean? I mean, we should fix it, right? Yeah, we should fix it. It's going to be one of those really strange, bizarre things that you never understand what's going on. Does everything work once the UAC prompt is gone? Well, I mean, the, B, if the BA shows up uh, like prompts for something during yep. a callback. It's yep. going to do the exact same thing. Aha. Uh -huh. So, so I was on just on the same thread, right? Yep. I was just showing the UAC prompt as yeah, as one people of the... are definitely going to run into this whether the BA is doing the right thing or not. Do you have an idea what the fix is? I think we're going to have to build our own queue. I think we're going to have to post the messages to our UI thread, the one that's right. listening for shutdown requests. Yeah, I, it, it's the we need to turn our our thread message loop into a Windows message loop. Right. And then we'll just have to have our own internal queue for the what gets picked off from the window message queue. Uh, that's unfortunate, isn't it? Yep. A bit. Is there a way to get all the UI off of the thread? No. <laughs> There's not. Because the BA can always show you why. And in the Raymond Chen post, it was saying that com, when you make like a cross oh, apartment yeah, right. thread. Calm things, who knows? Yeah, they will do all kinds of funky stuff underneath. That's right. Yeah, that'll get you all that invisible goo will really get you. Okay. Um. Yeah. I, that queue, that's really unfortunate about having to create our own queue, though. I'm surprised no one's complained about this before. Yeah, I guess it's not very common to do this. I, 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 I am, too. I'm surprised that it's gone this far. Um, well, cheers to Raymond Chen, and thank you for making our or for telling us why our lives are more difficult than it feels like they should be. <laughs> right, that's the accurate way to feel, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's one um, way to feel. Uh, this does not have to be preview zero, though. No. It, it'll make burn better, but it will not change it. Um, all right, burn does not repair an MSI with a minor update patch. That's correct. That's what I was saying. Just. Use small updates. Don't do minor upgrade patches. But people tell me that that's not all enough, so fine. Um, I what's the even though we're superseded in the like this is basically saying that the to finding out that the MS so the issue is that when you apply a patch, it changes the ver that changes the version of MSI, which is a minor upgrade patch. Then Burn is going to think that when it sees that MSI, it's going to be like, oh, a newer version of this MSI is on the machine. It's not mine, therefore I shouldn't mess with it, which is correct in some cases. Um, Most, I in, argue. In any non-patch cases, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then in the patch cases where uh, you, where Burn or one of its patch friends applied the patch that updated the version, then it's like, oh, no, actually you do own this MSI. Well, this test was specifically for the slipstream, where you 
in the authoring, you said you wanted this patch slipstreamed with this sure. design. Sure, sure. But um, it's also going to apply with the patch bundle. It's going to apply with the patch. I mean, it's going to apply in wider cases than just this test. Um, well, no. So it, it should be able to see that, all right, this MSI has a slipstream patch. And then it should be able to see, okay, the installed version matches the patch that was slipstreamed. Right? But it also it, needs it, to support repair in the case that a patch was applied by a different bundle or no bundle at all. Yeah, Jacob, this is a case where if a bundle has both the MSI and the MSP authored in, you can do what Sean's saying. And the case that Bob's bringing up is that, for example, if you put the MSP in another bundle that patches the first bundle, then the first bundle, of course, will not be able to tell that it is being patched because the patch came from another bundle that patches it. God, too many patches in here. Um, so it won't be in the same chain. It will be in a chain that comes in a related bundle later, a patch-related bundle. And so that's the more complicated case. Okay. Yeah. So that's what Burn does today. And that's what Burn does today is it doesn't know, so it ignores it. And then things will not, like on uninstall, we probably don't do the right thing, do we? Where we uninstall, the main bundle will be like, that MSI is superseded, so I won't uninstall it. It removes itself. It then removes the patch bundle. The patch bundle is like, oh, hey, my patch is still applied. Let me take that off. It takes the patch off, and then the MSI ends up being back to the version that the first bundle should have recognized as being removed. Ugh. Wait. Are superseded packages not uninstalled? It, it uninstalls the package. Okay, so superseded packages are uninstalled. I yeah. guess it owns it, right? Right. Okay. Okay, so that's better than I feared. It'll at least do, it'll do the dependency dance and then it'll remove it. Okay, well, that's better than I feared. So the and only problem there's is some, repair. Okay. I think there's some confusion between there's a bundle that has a patch and then there's a bundle that is a related bundle with type patch. So we're talking about a bundle with a patch, right? Sure. That, that's that's one case. case. Yep. That's the slipstream case. That's one case. Yes. No, but you were saying you were bringing in multiple bundles and you said a patch bundle. So what did you mean by that? You have bundle A and it has MSI V1 in it. Then you have bundle... Slipstreamed. No, right. just an MSI. That's... No, just an MSI. Although, no sure, slipstream it too if you want. No, I mean, no, let's keep it simple. You have bundle A that has MSI V1 in it. And then you ship a bundle B, which is a patch bundle for A, and it contains the MSP that takes the MSI to V1.1. That's essentially the same case, except you're not doing it by putting the patch in bundle A, you're putting the patch in bundle B, but the same scenario occurs. It's harder, well, I don't, I'd argue. I think that's a completely different scenario because if you try to repair the original bundle, then I think it's completely valid that it's not going to repair it because it's not, because it's truly superseded. Right. Yes, that's correct. I guess the second patch bundle then is going to come along and say, hey, I need to repair my patch, so go ahead and repair the MSI. Maybe it ends up working out in that case. Well, the bundle's not going to repair an MSI that's not in the chain. But the bundle that contains the patch will say, I have this patch, let me repair any MSI that is patched by this patch. And Burn I don't remember if we do that It does not have logic. that behavior. It doesn't have that logic. I mean, you could have an argument that that's the way it, it could work. Um, well, it'll repair the patch, which ends up being a repair of the MSI with the patch in view. That's not the behavior I'm seeing. Yeah, I don't know okay. that you wrote that, that one. I, that, I mean, I, no. could, I, I could see it. I mean, if you want to repair the patch, that's what you have to do. You have to go find all the targets that it was applied to and repair them. But it's hard because you may not have the, I mean, see, that's tricky because you may not have the, uh, the arguments, the command line arguments, the, the properties 
to pass that MSI, those all those different MSIs you target, because the patch doesn't normally care, um, arguably, um, during a repair. I I, I want to say it does, um, or it it should have, because that was you know a pretty big deal in uh, large patch scenarios like VS Update. Yeah. Uh, but I admit it, I could be wrong. Um, also remember that we, we do also have the scenario of a patch being applied without being part of a patch bundle. So even though we might get the dependent, uh, you know, the, the, sorry, the related bundle automatic repair from a patch bundle, um, it seems we're still missing out on repair of a, of an MSI package that was patched outside of the burn ecosystem. Yeah. So are we saying that this is just a too small of a scenario it's not worth worrying about or No, I I'm I mean we definitely could do that. This this would be more correct for the slipstream case. I'm, I'm not arguing against that. I'm just trying to think through the the complete scenario beyond the, the other scenarios when patches are applied, not just when they're slipstreamed um, or contained within the same. Is it slipstream? I guess when they're contained within the same bundle. Although if they're slipstreamed. Right. If they're slipstream during repair, then the patch would not. Sean, are you certain that patches um, aren't repaired like that in burn? I mean, that they don't repair all their targets. The test is failing when I run it. <laughs> okay. So the test deletes a file that was installed by the MSI, it repairs, it does a repair operation and it repairs the patch, but the file is not getting fixed. Replaced. It repairs the patch. Hmm. How does it repair the patch without installing the MSI again? I mean, the logs there, if you want to see the <laughs> command line. Does it not have the whole log? Action repair target product code that per machine MSI burn MSI repair UI level repair disable exam. Yes. All that makes sense. So yeah, see this is what I this is what I expected is that it created a target for this with this product code. Do you know if that product code is the same as the package A? Yeah. It is. It is. All right, that's great. So now that means we should be running. I don't know why that log didn't have Wait, but, anything okay. after plan, or does it have more? No, I'm done. That's it. I don't see the execution. This looks right to me. This, this, see, this actually works out then. The MSI is skipped, but the patch is not skipped because, like, I'm applied. And the end result is that this MSI the, that was marked superseded is going to get repaired because that's what the MSP target does. Is it ends up saying, hey, go repair this target product code, which is that MSI. So in the end, the right thing happens and the MSI gets repaired. Well, it should. Um, well, what it, what it does is it reinstalls the patch. It doesn't repair the MSI. Yeah, when it executes that MSP target in action, what it does is it reinstalls the patch. Mm -hmm. Which is not enough to repair the underlying MSI. Reapply 
size of the patch. What does that end up doing? If it doesn't repair the MSI, then what's it doing? It's just applying the transforms again, make sure they're all saved correctly? I mean, if I remember correctly, install and repair end up doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I'm try I don't know what the Windows installer is doing in that case. It's like, what is it doing if the patch is already installed and you're like, install it again? What does the Windows installer actually do and what use is it? Um, versus, hey, here's this patch. I want you to apply the patch. I want you to repair the patch, which means that you need to rerun the MSI to do so, presumably. Yeah, but installing installing a patch is is a repair of the MSI yeah. with the patch in view. Exactly. That's why I don't know what installing the patch without or reinstalling. What does reinstalling a patch mean? Does yes, it... exactly. That's the part I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's the thing to go understand. So th where I'm at is that I don't know if the MSI should be repairing it. The supersede MSI should be repairing itself. Because the correct answer may be, no, no, don't worry. You're a superseded MSI. You don't repair yourself because somebody else needs to be in view for you to be repaired and or it has taken ownership of you. And then later on, when the patch comes along, it's like, hey, I need to be repaired. To do so, I need you to repair these MSIs, <laughs> which ends up repairing the MSI that said it was superseded. Um, it could be that that's the way it was, that it could work out. Um, without having to do the logic of saying, hey, this MSI is slipstreamed, let me recalculate its version to figure out that, oh no, actually, I slipstreamed this patch, therefore, yes, this MSI is not superseded, it's actually the one that I own. Um, which is interesting logic to do as well. I just don't know how hard it is to recalculate all that, um, and if that's the best way for it. Does that make sense, Sean? Those two different ways that it could be working? I mean, this is getting past the point where I care. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes down to... Yeah, I mean, that Jake was right. That's one test could do it that way. If you repair the MSI via the command line, does it fix the original MSI? Um, or is burn not passing the... Or is burn doing too little when it's repairing a patch? Maybe that's the problem. Um, I mean, I found the log, but it doesn't actually have the command line parameters that it's passing. It's not like an MSI where it'll show you everything. Well, that's too bad. That might be a useful thing for it to do. Um, but it would still show the... Um, uh, do you have the MSI log, the package log? Uh, That'll show there's none. Right, that was superseded, so there should be none. I thought for the patch there was. I mean, that this is the line that burn is logging. Fine patch. Yeah, it's, it's emitting the, it's emitting stuff like the, you know, patch equals. But you want to, I mean, I had the MSI log. Is there something you want me to find in it or? Well, the I... command line will be right on top of that log. Yeah, here at the top. But Did I think reinstall yeah. equals all get passed in or something to that effect. Well, I guess I should probably just attach this to the bug. So let's see if I can get that working. Ah, so much for patching. All oh, because they didn't build it in very first version of the installer. And it's always just bolted on layer on layer on layer. Do you know and what I'm going to have to do to upload? Am I going to have to do a new comment? Yes. I, I, yeah. I don't know if you can edit it in. but Oh, really? 
Am I getting a cash fee with by not being logged in? Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Most people aren't most people aren't logged into GitHub to get a cash view. Can you do like control F five? Just keep banging on it until it opens. Command line, burn MSI repair, patch equals yes. patch code, reboot. This is what I expect to see based on the code. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, but let's look for reinstall. Um, Try to bring it up as a text file. Sorry, I can't share this. Actually, maybe. No, this isn't. This is not doing a reinstall. There's no reinstall command here. Yeah, but so this MSI is, will calculate one based on the on the patch, and it is. It's reinstalling the complete feature, which I'm guessing it's you know sufficient. Um, the uh, yeah, look at install validate. It's asking for reinstall and the components. Getting yeah you know, action local. So, and what's the file that we're looking for then? Uh, package .wxs. Haha, I love it. Ah, there it is. Executing op component register. All right, so that component was not registered for some reason. I don't see it being copied. Maybe I'm just missing it. No, it's not. I see the component being registered, but the file's not being copied. Right. File component. Action local. But it's not... And the file was missing. Wow. What's the default reinstall mode? Yeah, that's... <laughs> you and I went the same place, didn't we? Yep, yep, yep. It's not, whatever, yeah. So it's reinstalling the one feature, which is fine. That's the one feature the patch applied to, or who knows. But um, it got the right answer there, at least. Um, but whatever reinstall mode. So it's not reinstall mode. So arguably, maybe that's the real issue, is yeah. that repairing patches aren't sending in a reinstall mode the way that the ones the way that MSI packages do which means that it's not kicking off or it's it's not kicking off a repair it's kicking off a reinstall which would explain everything that we see there yeah and that yeah. could be the bug is that the patch when doing repair look at its reinstall mode and go oh look the patch didn't reinstall duh but the default reinstall mode is omis so it should be installing should have the file got if that it's file. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. We're not going to debug this here, but um, there's more debugging to do down there. We need to, yeah, there's more debugging to do in there to understand that. Um, so uh, I think we should at least, we should debug this a little bit more to understand it, and we should put it in 4 of. It's not a preview zero. Sean, are you bored with this one? No, oh, I'm done with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's even that's that's really bored with it. Then I will take it and and debug. I have, unfortunately, I have a bit of patch experience. All right. Not preview zero. All right. Continuing on. Am I in the right place? Hash algorithms. Yes. Uh, Burn should support alternate hash algorithms. Did we move to SHA-2, Sean? Or did we just so talk about moving to it? There's another issue that I need oh, to do of going to SHA-512. Forget 2. Let's just go straight to 512. Um, okay. 
So I guess that would be my vote would be just only allow SHA-512. Well, so I open this explicitly in the in the realm of um, update bundles. Um, the set update method basically, you know, lets you do nothing, which is interesting, and shot one. Um, but you know, all the the crypto stuff that Burn is using basically would let you specify arbitrary uh, hash types. So this is a case where where if your your update feed if you want if you want signature checking your update feed has to um, include hashes based on the algorithms that Burn supports, which today is a singular algorithm SHA-1. Um, I'm just wondering if separate from what Burn uses internally for hash checking, whether the update mechanism should support additional algorithms. I think it should only do algorithms that are better than the one, default one. Like once we go up to SHA-512, I don't think we should allow anything less. And Jacob, I'm pretty sure I saw that was an XP SHA-512. Yeah, I think it's XPSB2 added it. I don't, I mean, SHA-512 just takes more space, but that's not, it's not in the space that we're worried about. It's in the manifest that gets compressed. So it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I don't have, I mean, we can go straight to 512 and declare victory and move on and hope I, that. I mean, I mean that's... The, the more underlying problem, honestly, is that SHA gets broken completely. Um, and then, you know, that such that 256 and 512 don't save us at all. So then we have to go figure out whatever the next thing is. But I don't even know what that is these days for the general purpose hashing. I don't think they're worried about SHA 512 yet. No, I'm, I worry, like... Like someone figures out how to break Shaw such that it doesn't matter how many times you rotate through something mathematically oh. wrong with it, right? Well, there's the Shaw one and Shaw 256, 512. Those are two different hash families. Yes, sorry. Like the algorithms are completely different. Yeah. The it Shaw just two happens if, to have they, the same name. Yeah, if they break the Shaw two, and then it doesn't matter if you're 256, 512, or whatever, that's all. But if they break the family, but I, if they do, then we'll have to release an update that moves us to whatever people move to. Cause I don't hear anybody else. Like, what are the other hashing algorithms people use for this thing today? I haven't heard of another family. I don't know. Yeah. So, all right, I'm fine going just to 512 and declaring victory. I don't know. That shouldn't create a burden for anybody, right? That shouldn't create a what? shouldn't create a problem, a burden for other people, right? Like, I don't think so. You have to generate a SHA-512 thing. People will be like, oh, I don't do that very often, but that's fine. I mean, because 256 is definitely more common right now. Yeah, but if we're not going to update it for another 10 years, then... No, I, I don't have any problem with 512. I don't think it should be a problem. It's not that hard to do 512 versus 256, right? I don't think there's... Any difference besides just passing in yeah, 512 number. instead of yep. 256? Okay. So I think that's fine. So I think the answer is no, but we should move this to 512 then. Right? Yeah, I thought this was just going to be part of the work at yep. the other original issue. Uh, it was more towards Bob. Well, uh, um, yeah, uh, the downside is if we're not going to support other algorithms, then we have to say, you know, your feed must include a SHA-512 hash, and if not, you have to, you know, fall back to nothing. Correct. That's 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 why I was bringing up the whole, is SHA-512 a hard thing to generate? Um, I'm, I guess I'm fine with it. We're just like, yeah, we jumped ahead of Shaw too. 
go for you know, all the way to 512. But, you know, boom. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be running it unelevated anyway, so there shouldn't... I'm not sure how much difference there is between the two. B between having it verified and unverified No, no, my, my only concern is, is, you know, is forcing a particular algorithm. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say we're, we're telling you to do the, you know, to do this big one. So you'll be as secure as burn is in the rest of its hash checks. Um, it's just, it's a, you know, again, we have to force it if it's not whatever burn uses. Um, it's a, yeah, just one more, one more change you got to make. I'm, I'm, yeah, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say the update mechanism supports whatever burn is using. It's probably better to say burn uses one algorithm because it's good enough. Right. I mean, we can add things that are better than SHA-512 if we want. I'm not, that's fine. No, I'm just, I'm just suggesting... Uh, it's it's another change. It's another change as part of the move to Wix4. True. That's true. It's it's you know, it's it's an ancillary change. It's not you know, it's not an authoring change. It's not something Wix convert will convert. It's not yeah. something you know, converting your BA is going to do. You need to you know, dig in. Uh, right. But again, I think that's I think that's yeah, perfectly reasonable. All right. So I think the answer is we're not taking this, and the answer is 3992. Yep. Is 3992 is not preview zero. I don't know. I guess it doesn't have to be. It can be mostly invisible, except in this one case, which uh, well, I'm not too worried about that. All right. Okay. Ah, are we fine in mine? Wow. Let's skip mine. We'll go through a couple more. Um, then we'll come back to mine, because I think that's where we're going to end up for the day, which happens to be the, the Wix4 design decision. Um, system cannot find the file, yada, yada, yada. Um, this is probably antivirus messing with their build process, and they could try moving the cab cache. So this is like a support question, right? That's How to thought, avoid. Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. Let's kick that to support question. Support for elevating um, burn bundle extensions. Uh, this came out of... Yeah, nothing surprising here. Um, the idea is that, yeah, sometimes uh, pieces of Windows or other people have decided that detecting their software shall require you to have elevator privileges, which is just annoying, or detecting whatever is annoying. Um, IIS is one of the uh, violators. So the idea of here being that, hey, it'd be nice if uh, we could elevate once and have these detections or testers and, or whatever they are that need to run elevated to read this third-party software to run in the elevated side of burn to go gather that information. It's a completely reasonable feature request. Um, I'm not getting to it anytime soon. Sean, where do you want to stick it? Cause I, unless Bob wants it, but I'm guessing not. So it's kind of like, where do yeah, we stick it? It's just additive, so I I don't know when I if I, mean, I would get to it. Yeah, so this is not like 4.0. So it's like we put it in 4x, and if anybody wants to try to bring it back, that's fine. But now that I'm reading this, this is broader than I thought. Like, this should be scoped to searches. Like, like this issue should just be about being able to elevate an extension search. Or the flip side, there should be support or burn doing its own style of searches elevated. Because that would solve this no. problem, would solve the IIS problem. No, it won't, because I, IIS requires reading a custom file format. The file itself is protected by admin only. And also, eventually, there's going to be no built-in searches in the engine anyway. Well. That solves that problem then. Well, I, I guess I should say 
the ex four existing searches in V3 probably should be moved into the UDL extension now that the hooks are there. That's an interesting... <laughs> that dovetails with another thing I was working on. All right, we, we should talk about that. So anyway, this needs to be designed and we need to talk about it because um, we've had cases at FireGiant where we've built custom UIs where we need to test things that were not, that were UI related, right? It's like, uh, what was one of them? The customer wanted to be able to validate that they're going to be able to write to the drive that they're installing to. So to do that, we needed to elevate and run a thing that attempted to write to that directory because apparently that was a very large problem they had in the field of people picking directories that they could not end up writing to. Um, and that's not a detection, that's a UI interaction that I mean, you could argue isn't in here, but we want to wanna talk about that scenario if we want to be able to allow that because it's come up more than once. So anyway, this needs a whip, this needs discussions. Nobody's talking about doing that right now. So I think this goes into to 4X and it waits until someone decides they want to try to implement it. And it will be a very interesting thing to discuss. Lots of security implications. And also, hey, now you can run an elevated XE. Why don't you install the .NET framework using that instead of putting it in your chain, which of course would be the wrong thing. Um, anyway, patch seems to include more changes than was authored. Um, when I saw this, it made me think, is this a patching bug? Um, but then only talked about slipstreaming. Well, it was a slipstream integration test. Yep. But as far as I can tell, Burn is doing everything it's supposed to. Already. Did you happen to look at the patches to make sure that they were doing the right thing? I don't know enough about patches to know what to look for. Well, open it up, the MSI, then, up, then in, in Orca, and then apply the patch yeah. in Orca, and if the diffs look nope, correct. too far, too much. <laughs> I right. created the issue, and that is open for someone to look at. All right, fine. <laughs> so the question is, all right, we should put this in 4.0. We should look at this. Like, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a bug in patching, because there certainly could be a bug in patching. Um, Do the tests build the patches? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, gotcha. So go over here, run this test. I mean, you could just build the repo and you'll get, yep, the, patches. get the patches. You don't even have to run them. Yep, yep, yep. So that, uh, leave it at 4.0. I mean, it's not a not a preview zero thing. Yeah, all right, agreed. Um, but it's going to be, hey, look, there's a patch bug. And it'll be like, no way. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. Um, um, could you go back to 6353? You skipped 63. it. 6353. Oh, my my bad. I I I don't know. I read hashes twice and skipped the sixty three. Yes. Uh, today detect update doesn't pass the hashes if any are contained in the update feed. That lets you specify a hash. Uh, okay. So wait. The callback does not pass the hash from the feed. But set update says, hey, give me a hash. Oh, so you'd have Just to do your own feed configuration completely. Yeah. You'd have yeah, to, we should yeah. add that. That should be yeah. there. Kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, that's that's a oversight. Okay, I'll take it. Okay. Groovy. We didn't even give bon we didn't even give Sean a burn bug. Wow. All right. Oh right. Oh no, I take it back. <laughs> I have plenty to work on. Nice try. All right, so I want to go over here real quick just to show everybody that we're on the same page. Um, we're going to do design discussions now, and that issue that I was bouncing around turns out to be the thing that I pushed to the top because when I did um, the bitness work, which was um, fun, good, hey, it is a much better experience in my opinion um, versus what we had in the past, so yay, that all worked out. Um, as well as you would hope. Um, one of the things that stuck out was a discussion or a decision about registry searches and how, if and how they should follow fitness. Um, and Sean thought very differently than I did. And 
rather than trying to hash it out in email, I thought we would just discuss it here so that I can finish the bitness um, feature. So I'm going back over to the 6534, and we're going to go look at this uh, feature request. I guess it's a feature request. It's not a bug yet. It's not implemented. Um, all right, so in V3, the util registry search did not follow the compiler's platform. So if you in the compiler said, hey, uh, I want to build a 64-bit uh, a 64 bit package, your registry searches were still 32-bit. Um, and in V4, that was uh, in the Sorry, global sweep I to interrupt me. Yep. Briefly. 64-bit package, you mean 64-bit bundle. Sorry, 64-bit bundle. Okay, um, okay. Because the 64-bit package, yes, that that we swap bitnesses. Right. Um, so it was, okay. Right. So the question is in burn, and then, so I fixed it, it quotes there, in V4, so that everything behaved the same. When you have something that can swap bitness, the compiler switch sets the default, and then you can use the always 32 or always 64 if you want a search to be something explicit. Um, and Sean was arguing uh, that um, searches shouldn't be included in that because if you wrote it, you probably meant 32-bit unless you explicitly said 64-bit which was the old behavior. Right. Um, because I guess the majority of searches today are 64, or 32-bit, because um, the majority of software and things that you're looking for are 32-bit. Well, and burn was 32-bit, but whatever. Um, and so it's that feeling that searches shouldn't change versus they behave differently from everything else with bitness on them um, that I'm struggling with. Because I really don't like that everything else flips on bitness that can except the searches because it's a very surprising thing to find out. It's, it's inconsistent with everything else that changes. Um, well, on the flip side, I would say that there's nothing in burn that flips until you changed it. Well, there was no 64-bit burn in the past, so it wasn't really applicable. Well, what's flipping in burn? Now Other you can have than... a 64-bit bundle. Right. Now you can have a 64-bit bundle and... My no, I, no my, my point is there's nothing flips. <laughs> like you have util registry search, you have approved XE for elevation. There's nothing else in burn authoring that flips. Oh. Um. But that's, I mean, okay. <laughs> that's, that's also true for MSI packages, just there's a couple more things that flip. Yeah. So. What I'm trying to say is burn should not work like MSI. There's two two separate worlds. Yeah, and I, this to me, this isn't, it's not burn versus MSI, it's Wix and the arch switch. So well, to have burn behave differently means that we believe the language should be different here because bundles are different. Yes. I think bundles are different. And that's where I'm struggling because if you're building a 64-bit bundle, like Jacob's point out, chances are you're building it because, uh, one, you don't know, and you're just switching because you can, or two, you have, you're have you targeting a 64-bit OS that does not have the 32-bit um, subsystem on it, which is really the driving force to having a 64-bit burn. Um, well, someone else 
complained about they wanted their BA to be 64-bit because they wanted to use a library that was 64-bit. All right. Well, there, that's another interesting reason. But the in any case, you are building a 64-bit burn. Um, you are building a 64-bit bundle. And I think it's weird to me that a 64-bit bundle's searches would default to 32-bit. Given the scenarios that you would build a 64, the general scenarios you would build a 64-bit bundle, it feels just weird. It's like here, by default, here's your 64-bit bundle. It's going to um, naturally reach into 32-bit, and in one of the scenarios, one of the three scenarios of out of the you accidentally or you built it 64-bit just because you could, or two, you had a BA that needed to be 64-bit, and the third being you're building for Windows where there is no WoW 32 on it, um, which honestly I think is, the, to me, the biggest, most positive reason to use 64-bit burn. It seems really odd that burn by default would start searches in 32-bit when we know that it's going to be used on a 64-bit OS where there is no 32-bit. That, that's just the part, it just doesn't, doesn't fit. Right. If you're like, no, here's a search, it's always 32-bit, then you're going to know that that search is always going to fail when you build, when you install a bundle on a 32-bit, um, on a 64-bit on OS without WoW. I mean, I guess that's where my comment comes in, where if we want Burn to do flipping, I'd rather be the flipping done at runtime than by the compiler. What does that mean? You want a 32-bit bundle to search the 64-bit registry on a 64-bit OS. Yeah. Oh, that sounds even more complicated. So if... No. So that would mean that all... We would convert all searches to be always 32. And then if you want a search to do the, to do the bitness of the target machine, that would be how you do it. You don't specify, uh, or you leave it as the default for the business. Yeah, so this is moving it from the arch switch to runtime. So the bitness basically is just a pass through, and now the searches will have to look at the bitness bit, look at the OS, and then make a decision at runtime. That moves the whole thing to runtime decisions as opposed to build time decisions. I mean, for me, that's the only thing that makes sense. Because typically you're searching for a different product, and that different product has its own bitness. So the bitness of the search is tied to the product you're searching for, not the bundle you're building. There's another alternative, which would be to not have a default. To require you to, because of the, the I think Jacob said the OEM scenario, the you, you should have to be explicit about the search. So that OEM comment was about the elevation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it applies here, I think. Basically, when you're doing a search, you're you are searching for any number of things, but they fall into buckets. Like you're doing a search for um, for some other piece of software unrelated to yours that you're you know going to plug into or whatever. Um, in which case, the bitness matters very much. Um, and there's a relationship between that bitness and the bitness of your software, but it's not a hundred percent. You might be searching for, you know, bits of the OS, in which case I'd say there's a hundred percent match between your, between your bundle bitness and the OS bitness. So if you're building a 64 bit bundle, you are definitely running on a 64 bit OS and you probably want to look in the 64 bit registry or file system, whatever. Um, then it's the, another, maybe it's the third last bucket is you're searching for your own stuff, your own software related somehow to the bundle, 
in which case probably you want to match the bundle bits. There is no single answer that addresses all of those. Mm-mm. So defaulting might be wrong. Just it's the wrong idea. Other than that, I am plus one on being consistent. Yeah, I, I, I don't like all the... The thing I don't like is that it's going to... If this behaves like everything else, everybody's going to be like, yeah, okay, fine. I, I just always set always 32-bit on the searches that are always 32-bit. Or I set always 64 bounties on always 64-bit. Otherwise, it matches whatever I'm building. Now, you could, do, you could push all that to runtime, where if I'm running... But that just says that a 32-bit bundle running on a 64-bit OS is going to search in the 64-bit location. And that just feels like a surprise. I don't know why we'd want to delay it to then. I don't know the benefit of delaying it at that point. Well, in general, I, I want burn searches and MSI searches to work the same way. That could mean that we do all searches through you know, the burn search code so that they're consistent that way. Um, but it, it, I, I don't want them. I, I wouldn't want them. Again, I'm, I'm a fan of consistency in authoring and in behavior. I would like them to be, you know, consistent um, uh, unless they shouldn't be. So there's my escape hatch. Uh, <laughs> but that's where I'm, that, that's why I'm saying maybe there shouldn't be a default you might have to be, you might want to be explicit at all times in burn because it, it is a slightly different world. I don't think it's a hugely different world. I don't want to go that far, but I, you know, I can see that, yeah, there, there are some things that a bundle might need to do differently. Um, the confusion also, I think comes up because theoretically in Wix v3, you could build a quote unquote 64 bit bundle but it was always a 32-bit bundle. Now that's going to be different. Yeah. Cause... What, what was different if you accidentally built a bundle project 64-bit? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. I mean, it nothing. picked the same stub. Yeah, there nothing no... changed. Yeah. Right. So it was. It was. It should have been an error. Instead, it was a no. I mean, or it was just a. We silently fit, fell back to. No, you're actually getting 32-bit. Wish we hadn't done. If I had to pick consistency where it's as you implement it already, or no default, I would pick no default. Since you guys don't seem to be springing for the runtime behavior. Sorry, no, no. Uh, no, no, a little bit. If if as long as you could override it, but well, you override it by specifying. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, that yes. The problem again is it's inconsistent with every all the other things that you can get in the language today, which granted are limitations are essentially limitations of MSI. Yeah, I really don't care about consistency between MSI authoring and bundle authoring. <laughs> trying to keep them the same is just not worth it. Not well, it's the, not keeping them the same. It, no, it's the it's concept user the expectation. Same. Yeah, it's, it, it's you don't want to add a cognitive load that hey, when when this search is in MSI, it behaves this way. When it's in a bundle, it behaves this way. Um, well, that load, if means we you're tying it. your search code to how Windows Installer implemented it. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, if if it was a huge problem, I'd agree with you, but I'm I'm just struggling with the the runtime decision. I'm still like I'm trying to think through the 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 pros and cons of that one. So I mean one of the things to look at is that you know the way this is handled today I mean routinely look on GitHub, 
look on anytime your Wix user, I mean, just all over the place, where people need to support different platforms, today they handle it all via the preprocessor, right? Yeah. Everyone who does who needs to multi-target today has, you know, if something equals x86, then... Not, not everybody, but a lot of people do. But that's because we, well, we've done a bad job with our document the arch switch and how it's supposed to be used. None, uh, yes yes and i wrote a blog post over 10 years ago on this very topic um but but also it's because you have to for example to pick the right directory no longer true in wix4 right um but today you already have to do that even if you even if you uh uh you know know about how arch the arch switch works you still have to do some of that okay so a lot of people do it and a lot of people are already making an explicit choice in their authoring um and i'd say that that's also probably true in bundle author not so much the you know the preprocessor variable for the win64 attribute but the fact that burn even with a 32-bit bundle, Burns well supports 64-bit searches, which is unlike MSI. Mm -hmm. So I'd say a lot of that's already covered. You know, people are already being explicit um, because they can be. Because well, they can be they can be successful by putting 64-bit stuff in a 32-bit bundle. Right. Right. So program files. 6432 in burn switches at runtime. Uh, uh, really? Are you sure? Because mm -hmm. we don't have 64 bit bundles today. It's not a build time decision, it's a runtime decision. So what happens when you try to install a 32-bit package to the program file 6432 folder? You're just talking about like searches and the fact mm -hmm. that there's a variable. Correct. Okay. Okay. I mean, it, it doesn't. It's not a general-purpose solution. No. To the MSI bitness limitation. No. 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 I'm 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 going to the runtime switching of architecture. Yeah. No. No. Think, uh, runtime decisions. Yeah. Um, and the implications of them. Such that if you build and bundle and we run time to decide which architecture to run it under. That's a that's an option. I don't think defaulting to 32-bit all the time is an option. I think that inconsistency doesn't work. But the if you don't specify the bitness of the search, it determines at runtime the bitness of the search. And MSI can't do that, just like it can't with program files. 3264. Because that gets updated at build time. Switching at runtime is interesting. What are the downsides? It'll surprise you the first time you install your software on not the right OS. Cast. But it may give you the right answers most of the time. So I'm thinking like things like .NET Core, where they're starting to where they're starting to evaluate what do they do with multi with their multi architectural as their multi architecture stuff opens up more. Would they build a 64 bit bundle? If they built a 64 bit bundle, you had your bundle. The search then. .NET Core is not a good example. 
for searching. You're right. <laughs> I forgot. They're a terrible example, aren't they? Because um, they made things so challenging to find it. Um, really it comes down to if you're if you have a bundle and you're I'm struggling with when you'd want the thing to jump. Maybe a Windows where it's duplicated and you want the one that's in where sixty four and thirty two bit reg keys were duplicated and you want the one that's sixty four if you're on sixty four and you want and of course you're only getting at the one at thirty two if you want thirty two. I can't think of anything like that right now that you'd search for. It's basically wow at install time. I mean, I guess the easy thing to do would be just don't allow a default today. And then if we want to add the runtime later, we can. And yeah, and Windows Staller. There's never going to be a runtime option. So do we force everybody to specify the architecture for their searches all the time? Because if someone ever does the work to get the util reg the searches to work in MSI, like they do in Burn. We'd have the same problems here. Mm. Well, no, it, it could work the same in burn as it does in MSI. So whatever decision we made for burn, the same decision could be made for MSI. Yeah. All right, I'm going to think about the runtime scenarios more. I don't like the inconsistencies. To the point that we possibly shouldn't call it bitness if we keep it on the search. Like, we maybe we need rename the attribute on the searches. So it's just like, yeah, this is not the same as the other things. We're basically back to Win64, except, yeah, you take out default, and then it errors when it can't find the attribute, whatever the, whatever it is. I think it still works. It's just, in some cases, default or omitted is illegal. Yeah, well, default is removed, and then, yeah, the default was the default, and so there is no default. Uh, yeah, omitted is not allowed. Because we think you need to be specific about your searches, because the chances are you're going to need to be. That's what we're saying, right? I'm saying there's no 80% solution. So there's no way. That's, the, the fault is there's. It doesn't lean one way or the other. Not not strongly enough. Nope. There are too many scenarios for, you know, looking at the system. And different scenarios have different reasonable defaults. So 
So we're saying there's no default for registry search. And others? Well, see, it doesn't make does it make sense for MSI locator? MSI, look, can you have a 64-bit MSI locator in a reg locator inside an MSI? Can can you have a 64-bit reg locator in a 32-bit MSI? I haven't tried. Wouldn't surprise if they accidentally made that work or that didn't I, work. I, I want to say it works, but and this is why I asked about the other searches because you can search you you can do a ha huh, you can do a file search on a, the result of a registry search, but if it returns a 64-bit path, oh, it does MSI launches it. Yeah, yeah. So I think you can do a 64-bit registry search, but it uh, you know is of limited utility. Does that mean default doesn't work there either? For the MSI locators? Or, I mean... I, it's, I think it's in the same boat. It's just not quite as severe. If you're explicitly building a 64-bit package, mm -hmm. then a 64-bit search makes slightly more sense. But, again, if... Because, uh, basically because if you know you're searching for some other software some other ISV software it, it's for some kind of integration right probably maybe 70 percent 60 percent I don't know whatever it, it it seems likely that it's to allow some kind of integration in which case bitness matters and so if you're you know just say it's an in PROC integration, bitness matters. So, you know, you're creating a 64-bit package. It's probably to integrate with a 64-bit product, some other 64-bit product. So a default there, eh, it kind of makes sense. But, you know, that's not, again, it's not, I don't think there's an 80% scenario there. I would be perfectly fine if there were no defaults for any searches. That where business matters. So you had to be explicit on them. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could. I like the idea of being explicit there because, like today, the default is 32 bit unless you say 64. And, you know, but now you can, in well, Burns' case, you can build 64 bit bundles. Registers. Sorry. No, Registry yeah. search is the only one you can specify 64-bit on today. It's the only one with a Win64 today. Oh. Okay, well, that's fine. Narrowing the scope anyway. So then it just, that's why I threw it in this title here, is that MSI registry search and usual registry search then would be the same. Not follow, basically not have a default. That's where we're ending up, right? With the decision to possibly add runtime behavior to the util registry searches in the future. I think it's the least worst solution. <laughs> I just hope people don't learn from it to start putting bitness everywhere. On all of their, well, everywhere the bitness shows up. It's like, oh, well, there's no default, so I have to go put it everywhere. Like, no, there's only no default on the searches. Everything else, you probably should just default, if that's the right answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It it sucks because again, if you're trying to create a you know a 64-bit build, 
or your searches need to be 64-bit, but you also want to create a 32-bit build, then you you know have to res resort to the uh, preprocessor hack. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wait, when do you need to switch your searches based on the architecture? Probably, maybe you need to switch them. It again, it depends on why you're searching or what you're searching for. If you're searching for some other part, your product portfolio, then well, maybe you need to follow the fitness. Then there should be an option for that. They should be able to. You should be able to pick default. It's just that if you don't specify the attribute, the default isn't default. So, wait, you want to say fitness equals default means switch based on platform? Based on the arch switch. Arch switch? In both registry search and util registry search? Well, not both. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> we were so close. So close, man. And now we're back to inconsistency again. Um, I would actually be fine with that if, if, and, and maybe default is now the wrong word. Fitness equals follow. Ugh. Yeah, right. Follow, follow. That's I'm. Yeah, it needs a much better name. A value for the fitness switch that says do what. Uh, based on the platform build, search there. And, I'm, and now I'm going to call that the, the name of the value. <laughs> that actually, yes. There is no default, but that is an option in the fitness switch. Because that, that addresses my concern about, you know, unexpected behavior now that burn support 64-bit bundles. I guess you can make it four. You can say always 32-bit, always 64-bit, follow container. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> container's the wrong word because it's not package because it may be the bundle. And then right. the last, the fourth option is, you know, runtime decision. I guess it's build time decision oh. versus runtime decision. And then you make it explicit. Make it, yeah. all right, now yeah, it matches whatever the runtime. The fitness is, you know, runtime decision. I don't know. That doesn't work either, but the words don't work. The words need work. But yeah, that, that'd be fine. I mean, now you're faced with the problem of the fact that MSI doesn't do that. But Well, and then if you try to use runtime in MSI, it fails. Okay, sure. Because it's like, yeah... Wouldn't it be cool if MSI lets you do that? It doesn't. So, yeah. um, error. Um, you can't use that here. Yes, the wouldn't it be cool exception. Uh, take it up with Microsoft. Uh, kind of thing. Bitness. I think it's match build. Maybe it's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. C arch switch. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that said, go. Okay. Sure, with 99% people using MS build. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Uh, uh, C, whatever the name, platform uh, property which gets translated into platform target property for you automatically, but you can still override the property. No, no, no. Um, and I only know that because we had somebody do that at Fire Giant, and it threw us for a loop for a while trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Um, all right. Well, definitely give this to me. I don't know why this isn't assigned to me. That was silly. Um, it's Let's put it in preview zero. I'm going to look at adding the, the build time scenario. Or match build. I don't know what to call it. Um, should I add the runtime enum? 
Unless you're adding the code for it now. Mm. Yeah, just the dream of code copying. And just saying, hey, here's an email. It's not supported yet. <laughs> it's not implemented yet, essentially. <laughs> um, Preemptively um, sending that off. All right, I'll, I'll look at that. Okay. So if it's not default and it's match build. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll, uh, I can work from there. Um, it's already 11. So I want to ask one more thing, Sean, that you brought up. Um, actually, before I do that. Before I do that. Um, so we have plenty more things to talk about in upcoming weeks. Um, as always, these are nice, big, juicy discussions, but the end result of them is like a big final decision. So it's, it's good to have them and to get them all sorted out. Um, let's see. So questions, comments. Does anybody else, if anybody's left out there, have anything else they want to cover? Because I have a question if nobody else has one, but I want to give everybody else a chance to talk first. Um, and I'm going to drink some water. <laughs> I don't even know if we still have Jacob, if he's gotten bored and wandered off. <laughs> he's not responding, so it seems very possible. How could anyone not want to be thrilled with this conversation? Ah, 60. <laughs> yeah, well, their language design is essentially what we're doing here. Um, yep. Emo Landworth has the same sort of reactions I've when I've talked to him. He has the same sort of reactions when they discuss C sharp. So it's just it's nice. To All right. So here's my question. Um, so one of the things I'm hitting or I've been hitting is that there are a few symbols that are um, in the data assembly because they are native to burn um, but implemented in an extension because they can also be used by Wix, uh, by MSI. So the examples are right now searches, uh, the tag extension, and um, the dependency extension. Those are three that I know of right now. There may be others, but those are three I know about. And the the issue here is that searches, the util searches, the tag, and the dependencies are all natively implemented in burn. Therefore, the symbols for the things that are natively implemented in burn live in the data um, assembly. And then the rest of the implementation and handling is in the uh, extensions. And so, Sean, you said a thing that I had totally forgotten about, but you were talking about taking the searches out of burn and um, just using the util searches um, so that the symbols could then get pulled out and put into the extension completely, um, which makes sense to me um, if we want to go that way. Um, the dependency logic we're not going to be able to pull out into extension because that's how Burn does reference tracking on all of its um, packages. So I don't think we should pull that out. And the tag extension, um, Burn writes the SWID tag in the appropriate place um, because an MSI can't do it. Um, or couldn't. Anyway, the, bun the bundle writes its own SWID tag, so it has the logic in there to do that inside the engine itself. Um, so when you said, hey, we're going to take, we could take the searches out of the engine and put them into the extension, one of the things I've been thinking about is actually going the other way and just pulling these three concepts into the language itself and pulling them out of the, the extension namespace and just saying these are now natively part of the Wix language. And for MSI, you have to have custom actions to implement some of them. But in burn, you don't, and that's why we chose to bring them into the language proper and out of their extensions. And so I want to bring it up as a discussion point and, and to see if any of the, if, if that makes sense to you, Sean and Bob, and if, um, if you have a preference in any of that. So just to be clear, we're talking about going in in the exact opposite direction that we were talking about in the previous issue, trying to keep consistency between authoring an MSI and a bundle. Correct. We're, we're basically saying the lead You're basically concept... agreeing with me here that burn needs to be different. 
no, no. I, I'm actually saying that MSI is going to get the language enhancements as well. So, for example, the tag extension would go away, and the MSI backend would have all the logic necessary to do what the tag extension does. The dependency extension would mostly go away. All of its logic would go into the MSI backend. It's already in the burn backend, as is the tag extension stuff. No, tag, the tag logic will go both in the MSI backend and the burn backend. The dependency extension only has MSI backend stuff to enhance, so it goes in the Windows startup backend. And that just leaves us then with in the dependency case and maybe in the future, the registry searches, um, which are not supporting MSI at all, um, would need a extension to bring along custom actions, to insert custom actions into your MSI to implement them. So well, so today the tag extension has a custom action in addition to the mm, – No? For, for MSI. Yeah, there's a custom action, right? It's dependency the, does. Oh, damn it. That's Even if tag doesn't, dependency yeah. does. Dependency yes. does, tag doesn't. Yeah. So where does that custom action DLL go? So the custom action is um, it is all about displaying UI for it. So the idea was that you can um, put the dependency logic into your MSI. And if you want to have the UI uh, pop up, you have to you somehow reference it. And there's a couple different ways. One, we could keep the dependency extension, and if you pull the dependency extension, it will bring in the UI into your MSI to throw the appropriate dialog boxes. We could move it into the UI extension and say, hey, if you want UI for your dependencies, reference the UI extension and reference, I want to display messages for my um, for the UI. That would be another way of doing it. Um, the reason dependency logic is interesting in the MSI, even independent of choosing to have the custom actions that block on it, is that Burn will read that logic out of MSIs and do behavior on them. So even if your MSI doesn't do all the things, Burn will do appropriate reference tracking on top of MSIs. And that makes sense, because why have custom actions in MSI if they're never visible to the user? Technically speaking, those custom actions should never be able to fire. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the, the logic as it goes down. So it, it bypasses the problem by saying the custom action still comes from an extension because um, it still comes from an extension and you and dependency is the one where you only need UI. Searches are a little bit weirder because <laughs> basically if you use the searches inside MSI, then, um, then you need to have a custom action. And maybe that solves the problem, and maybe what you're doing by pushing all the searches out of burn, that solves the problem. It's just like, hey, yeah, they're all out of burn. Burn doesn't come with searches. Part of me hurts a little bit to think that burn doesn't have a way of searching by itself, but that's that that's not an engineering thing. Just a really, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, it, it works we... fine. Everything works the same. It's just it's not built in the burn anymore. And like, okay. But as we've talked before about the size of the burn stub, it, it's, it becomes interesting to look at ways of using bundle extensions to, you know, cut out functionality that you don't care about. I, I, I agree, but, I mean, who doesn't have searches in their bundle? <laughs> just, well, yeah, yeah that, that's fair. That's I, fair. I, and it's unlikely we're going to get down to the granularity of saying, you know, oh, I don't care about file searches, so don't link that in. But, yeah, I don't think so. So that might work. That, if searches move out of the burn engine and I get over my pain of losing searches in natively in the engine, um, then the rest of those would work okay. Well, I think the tag extension is still kind of weird, right? Well, no, the tag extension would go away. That's the, the statement, basically, is that we have built into Wix the understanding of tags. And in the burn engine, there's logic to handle it. And in the case of an MSI, we just, you know, do the – we create rows for you in the back end to make it happen. It's essentially uh, some of our uh, sugariest syntactic sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Highest um, – uh, fr uh, was it corn syrup content of <laughs> sugary 
goodness, it is very high on the list of things that are sugary goodness. Although generating goods is pretty badass too when you think about what we do there, um, the amount of work we do to generate those too. Um, so I although I'm, I'm going to object to the high fructose corn syrup because it's generally considered bad for you, but we're saying these oh, are yes, good for you. Okay, this is like a whole bunch of bananas. I don't know. Highest concentration oh, of fructose possible. That, that's, that's just a very odd metaphor. Um, my only, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to bringing more stuff in, although it, it gets a little weird about um, talking about how um, how different things end up. We, we've had this thing for a while. It's like, if you don't use any extensions, then you know there's no Wix code that ships in your MSI. Um, speaking of that would still be true. Right, because what you're saying is we might still have extensions simply to supply custom actions. Correct. Okay. And in both of these cases, the custom actions could truly be optional. Um, well, it's just the MSI one that's optional, right? And if the registration searches actually go the way Sean was intending, then it goes the opposite of the way I was thinking. It's like they just come out of burn, so then it's nice and clean that way. And it's just the tag and the dependency that go in and the extensions for the custom actions for the dependency stuff, I can make a decent case for never wanting them in your MSI. I find it really weird for the dependency extension that you would specify dependencies, but then it wouldn't block you at all from uninstalling if it has dependence. Well, the, if you don't have any UI, right, then chances are you're shipping inside of if you're shipping inside a burn bundle and you don't have a UI, then you don't need the checks because burn is doing them. Well, my point is is that you can use the language to build an MSI that has dependency behavior in it, but none of that actually triggers because for well, it some can reason, trigger. I mean, it right now if you you know run silent, the uninstall just silently fails. Only because the of only the case. Only because of the custom action. Oh, that's true. That's true. You know, you're right. You're right. Never mind. I was going to say the the UI pop up only happens if you you know explicitly run it with you know so greater that, than basic UI. It, I I don't disagree, Sean. It's like it's like here if you use dependencies, you may want to have these custom actions as well, right? But the the metadata in the package is useful just for when you mean including the burn, for example. I mean. Yeah, I guess you just throw a warning when you build a dependency MSI without that extension. I don't know. I'm torn on including the custom actions when using dependencies, but yeah. Yeah, that's weird. I, I just think it's weird if we would allow that silently. Well, I mean, it could be a required attribute. Specify whether you want to block the UI or not. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not UI. I mean, it's just the blocking part. The UI is yeah. secondary to me. <laughs> whether you want the MSI to enforce the dependencies, or if you just want the metadata there, and let the bundle do it. Right. Because see, in, in most cases that I've seen, these are used. These MSIs are used inside bundles, and the MSIs are never visible. So the only way you get into these kinds of scenarios where you're act, you're you're messing up the dependencies is if you're uninstalling via the command line. And at that point, you can pass the whole I forget whatever switch it is to say ignore the dependency thing anyway to, if you really want to get rid of it. So, I mean, you're you're protecting against a system where someone's really you know, inspecting underneath and removing things out from underneath you. So the yeah, custom fine action. With it. I was just trying to point out it's weird. Yeah, it, it's the yeah, it, it's the enforcement. Do you want the enforcement or not? Essentially, I like the idea that that becomes an option, though. Say that again. 
I like the idea that to not enforce it, to not enforce it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, back in the uh, couple versions of Visual Studio ago, everything had that block in it. And, you know, if you had to recover your system because the Visual Studio installer screwed up, not that that happens often, except to me, apparently. Yeah. Um, To you all the time. Yeah, it did. Um, You know, to uninstall silently requires, you know, you have to pass in extra parameters to to do the uninstall. I, 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 I agree with Rob that the idea of specifying the the data should be separate from the enforcement. Whether it the, whether it defaults to enforcing is a different question, and I kind of I think Lean Chan's way there it seems reasonable that it should default there. So uh, so then going down this path a little bit farther, assuming that we're going to break the custom action out separately, bring the dependency and tag concepts into the language, so they're going to get promoted into the language, then is it better to have a dependency extension, Wix extension, that if you include it in your compiling um, and linking, that it automatically adds the extension? Or is it better to have a dependency extension and that you have to explicitly make a call out to say you want the blocking and UI behavior? Or should it be put into UI extension and then you automatically or explicitly? So basically, should there be a should there be a dependency Wix extension, or should we roll it into UI? I don't know. Well, and then, I agree with Sean that the UI is separate from the enforcement, or the UI is part of the enforcement, but it's another layer on top of it. Fair. I put it in UI because it was it had some UI and it kind of had that user interface thing. But again, that's the question: no, it, Could it, it live in UI, or should it definitely live in its own standalone extension? It should not live in UI. I think okay. that's false advertising. Okay. Whether it has to live you know, in an extension entirely is like, well, I don't want to put it in util. So. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry. No, no, uh, where I was going is, um, do we need an extension at all? Um, if all we're going to do is supply a custom action, then we could just say, here's a Wix slip, right? We've done that before. Yeah, that that doesn't have any of the delivery mechanisms that we're providing right now, but... Um, that is completely fair, and there's no reason it couldn't be an extension, um, because that would allow what you suggested that if you include it, then it would automatically yeah. uh, include the the custom action. Yeah. Just for the record, I don't think naked Wix libs as distribution as as a broad distribution is the right way to go. Wix libs are really like a user thing. They're like yeah no no that's because that's, of the experience around it is kind of it, it's really a hook it, it's essentially hey you can't find the symbol and you have to know that go get this Wix. it's just it's far away where an extension can give can get in there and be like hey yeah, here's my very it. nice error message that tells yep. you exactly what you need to do yep no that's fine uh, um so that says keep the dependency extension to bring about the custom act the, the custom actions is it should it, if you add the dependency extension and you have dependency stuff, it automatically adds the things, or should you explicitly ask for them? Because the compiler extension could, right. at the end, just scan and go, hey, I've noticed that you're using dependency stuff. Let me toss in these custom action references as well. Right. And if you don't, then the dependency extension just silently does nothing. Um, it could do that automatically. Or it could be more of an explicit, hey, uh, you said you wanted... To, this thing, you, you wanted the blocking behavior, and if you don't provide the extension, you'll get an error because that's written in your authoring, right? So it's it's more yeah. explicit, not implicit. You got the extension, therefore it worked, or you didn't get the extension. I, I'm a little worried about the mysteriousness of the extension being present versus not present. Right, right, yeah. That's I'm I'm more in favor of it being explicit because of that. It it's it's magical behavior. It has to be explained. It can't be discovered. So. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you mark something explicit, then it's like, oh, well, I did that. So when you get the error message that says it can't find the custom action, you might put two and two together. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I say this because I was working on the allowing extensions in the back ends and all that kind of stuff, and I started hitting all these problems where the symbols were mishmashed all over the place, and it was 
creating strange dependencies between things. It's like, oh, this is not correct. So, all right, I'm going to go revisit that. Sean, so on that front, do you, on the burn side, is it still your intention that searches are pulled out of the engine? Or do you think that given that I'm looking to do it as tags, do you think it'd be better to push these searches more natively into the engine and into the language? Um, do you have a preference there? I, I don't really have a preference. I wasn't planning on doing that work myself, <laughs> so. All right, then I, I'm, I'm going to see how the tag and the dependency extension go, because those are blocking, and I, given their behavior inside, how deeply ingrained they are in some of the behaviors of both uh, MSI and the burn, I'm going to try to, I think I'm going to bring them down. Um, or I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to bring them down to language, up in the language, down, whichever direction. Um, and then we will revisit the searches. And, and, I, and as I do that, I'll keep the searches in mind to see which way, um, if I get a better feeling of it should go one way or the other. All right, that was my last question. Um, bit of, I got to slip that design question that I hit um, earlier this week as I was working on this stuff. Um, so We have three layers of design questions. We had triage, we have explicit design discussions, and then Rob slips one in Q&A. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that before. Um, on that note, are we at two hours almost? Almost two hours, right? We're like, Yep. Five minutes off to ours. Um, oh gosh. I'm going to have to go pick up my daughter at school soon because they're only doing half days with COVID. Um, and if that's not disruptive, yeah. All right. Okay. So there we go. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, I assume. I didn't even look. What's in two weeks? The 4th of March. I don't think there's anything special about the 4th of March. That should work just fine. Um, we'll do this again 4th of March, and um, I'm going to try to push it back to 9, to get the meeting back on track for 9.30, hopefully as um, it's not the first day of school, um, and there aren't all the new kid um, excitement and butterflies and jitters about going to a big place by yourself. Um, hopefully my timeline will move smoother, so I think we can get these back to 9.30 on Thursdays. Um, Pacific time. So I think, unless you guys have anything else? Nope. 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 All right. On that note, we'll be back in two weeks. Everyone have a wonderful thing. Sean, stay warm. And uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.